Welcome to this uh, the Sustainable Tech Talk. Uh, we will be going over the Secure Storage Project. And so let's start. Um, technical problem. So, uh, so basically, as Sustainable, so we are a payment processing company, right? And we also store uh, sensitive customer information. In our case, is the credit cards. Um, in the future, we also have plans to store uh, ACA checks uh, in the case of sensible pay. So why even bother um, storing this customer sensitive information? Um, isn't it sort of, yes? So ACA, it's a payment type which is available in the US. Uh, so you basically provide the bank uh, the routing number and account number. Um, it's sort of like a, a check account. It's US based, so um, moving on. So why bother sort of storing sensitive information? Is not it more of a hassle sort of? Um, so this provides us as a company with um, more functionality that we can provide to our customers. So for example, um, a function that we provide is rebuild subscriptions. So um, the, the one that's buying the form basically, you can choose to uh, instead of just buying a subscription for once, um, it can be a, a rebuild subscription. So, for example, every month, it, uh, we immediately um, update his subscription. So he doesn't have to put in his uh, details again. The subscription is automatically updated. Another capability is card blacklisting. So we can know uh, if a card is blacklisted on our system. Um, this complements as well the fraud system Sysibil has, the vSCRUB, which is, a, again, another feature which sort of uh, we're known for. Um, another thing is reporting. So given the, from the support page, um, we can enter the card and we can know what subscriptions are linked to that card. And another thing as well is Sysibil Pay. So um, Sysibil Pay, we basically provide wallet-like capabilities like PayPal do. So we store, uh, we can link a card with an ID, and the user does not need to enter a lot of information when uh, processing a transaction. It can be faster, sort of. Okay, any questions so far? Cool. So a bit of history. Um, to store the credit card information uh, previously, and it's still in production, um, we have we have we have SDS, so um, secure data storage. And this is not PCI compliant. We'll be going over why it's not PCI compliant later on. Um, we don't have any redundancy since this system is only available on Phoenix. Um, it's mostly legacy code, so the server is in C. Um, we don't know much about it. Um, how we connect to it is through pair scripts, um, and it's extremely painful to debug as. We, we found out when we were coding uh, secure storage. For example, uh, one of the things that it has a successful request, the only information that we know is just a simple dot. So that's all the logging that we have. So, so let's go over the SDS process flow. Um, you have your user that goes to a payment form. So it's, in our case, it's either JPOST or Flex form. Um, the user enters the information, including the credit card information, and he places an order. Uh, this information gets sent to the legacy transaction system, which again, it's a collection of page scripts, and again, it's uh, a legacy system. This sends a TCP request to the SDS server, um, which uh, it has its own database, and as I explained, it's in Phoenix only. So the SDS database, um, it just keeps the, the ID of which links to that card, and it has an encryption mechanism. And there is no redundancy at all? Um, what there is, it's on a machine level, so I guess you would have SDS1 and SDS2, for example. So, so it's, it's balanced between machines. There are, there are, no. Exactly. Exactly. No. Not on a satellite level. Same data center. Exactly. Sorry, is it passive or is it? Um, I'm not sure about this. Either one, same time. So, so we'd like to say, 
no native replication. Um, there's, it's an old database version, but it's, it's native replication. Um, no, database. No, it's my sequence, sorry, it's a no version. Okay, moving on. So, DSDS contract, what can we do with SDS? Um, so the first thing, obviously, is that we can store credit cards. So the, what, how this works is that we send the full card number and the expiry date to SDS. And SDS gives us back a card ID and the expiry date ID. So the, the card ID, it's auto-incremented. Um, it's uh, simply auto-incremented. And the expiry date ID, it's a simple computational value. So what does this mean? Um, so if it's 2020.05, the output is 215. The output for 2020.06, it's 216. So it's, it's auto-incremented in that way. Um, this is a sample record from the SDS database. So the data ID, this is linked to the, the credit card 510510. The data is actually the card number encrypted in some way. The, this is the expiry ID, and this is uh, the last update. So um, how is the last update affected? Basically, when we have a store request to SDS, if the, if the card is not there, then the, a new record is inserted. But if we hit the, do the same store card, but with a different expiry date, then it would be an update. So if, if we do a store on this card again, but with a different expiry date, then what would be updated in the database is just the expiry ID. The card ID does not change, it's, because we, it's unique. So uh, a card always has the same ID. Yes, exactly. So other things we can do is searching and retrieving. So searching it means getting the card ID from the card number. Um, a use case for this is, as I explained before, from the support page that we can get subscriptions both with card. So we provide the card number and it gives us back a card ID, as explained with this diagram. Um, as you can notice, the expiry date in this case, it's in irrelevant because we're only concerned with cards. And the opposite of it is retrieving. So we get the card number by the ID. A use case for this is three bills and sensible pay. So in case of, for example, of sensible pay, we keep the ID in our pay databases. And whenever making a transaction, we use that ID to fetch the full card number and uh, process the transaction with that full card number. Okay. Questions so far? Go. Oh. Moving on. Strongot. So, um, the Strongot is a third party secure storage implementation. It's not in house. Um, it's meant to be as the replacement for SDS. So, eventually, we want to get rid of SDS. Um, from a Strongot point of view, they provide us with a secure web service. They provide us the WSDL as well. So, we can easily generate uh, our own client to hook to Strongot. Um, it is installed as a cluster, uh, providing high availability and continuity. Um, we have replication between nodes on, on a satellite level, so we have uh, different data centers. In case we have problems with Strongot itself, we, we also have the support provided, and it's PCI compliant. So this is obviously the most critical factor why we want to move away from SDS. And this is hosted by us, so it's hosted by them. So uh, they, they give you a, a box, sort of, a, a machine, right? And it's literally a machine. It's literally a machine. And we have one on Phoenix, uh, on, Ash, on Ashburn, and in the Netherlands. And some of the things which makes it more PCI compliant is that, for example, we have key rotation. So on a early basis, the actual mechanism of how uh, the keys that are used for security, they're changed. There's very limited access, so even from application services point of view, um, only some people are allowed to configure the boxes, set the passwords, etc. And also the physical security of the boxes. So I don't know the exact details, but Bjorn was mentioning you have to have a card. I think like the levels of by USB or whatever they were color coded, right? Fake it. So 
it's it's quite it's quite secure. Any any change any change happens physically on the box? You have these two SD ports, and basically these are meant to be distributed between uh, specific people, uh, um, and they all have to they all have to be there to actually be able to change it. Um, like, uh, some maintenance or uh, specific encryption key resolution. So, uh, going back to the encryption key resolution, how are clients notified or the client wouldn't know? Yeah. But I, what clients are then our clients and the client application talking to it wouldn't know? And then you always tell so them. I think you are saying there is there are two levels. So if you're saying about client authentication to make requests, yes. That, that, that isn't actually, uh, it's a via password. So if you rotate the password, then you have to update the configuration to update. How is that done? Family? Right now it's manual. Um, I mean, when the application started, we keep the credentials in memory, so we have to provide them at startups rather than have them on a file store. But what we're speaking about here yeah, is the internal encryption of, of the yeah, 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 I don't know the client part. Yeah. So uh, when I when changing the encryption, mm -hmm. um, are you modifying all the existing data with the new key? No. So you're like unencrypting and encrypting the effect? No, that's how it works. There are different levels, but essentially that's what the it works. So you have a, a job as uh, part of the system. Um, it's not something that we do this part of the and re-encrypt with yeah. the new key, right. um, and you will do it um, in batches, so you wouldn't go on there. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, so it means that you have two active kind of. Yeah. But from our point of view, we're, we're sort of not going from a. Compared to even the client. Exactly. Exactly. What we what is on this this is just the strong both the actual physical machine. The box that we're talking about. This option to actually have multiple keys and you will have it by itself basically. The client would know by which key it's been and give you the correct data. In terms of I so we only deal with the ID where it gives us underneath takes care of it of all the inclusion like in this Okay, so let's move on. Um, so moving on to secure storage. So actually secure storage is our what we, we provide as a company. So this is an an intermediary before the storage technology. So from a secure storage point of view, we don't actually care where we're storing the, the card information, as in we do care, but it should be transparent. Um, it's irrelevant if the card is stored in SDS or strong God. Um, yes? About SDS and secure storage. One is secure data storage, the other is secure storage. Yes. Right? They're not the same. So, um, uh, I know. So let's put it this way. Um, SDS and strong God, they are st storage technologies. They, they're actually with actually store the credit card information. On top of them, so as seen in this diagram, we will have secure storage, which it's an intermediary. It's, it, it does, it's not concerned with how actually data is stored. It just interacts with the storage technologies and fetches whatever is needed. So um, secure storage was designed first to be backwards compatible with SDS. Um, the reason is that we want to keep integration with the existing cards we have in the system. We will achieve PCI compliance through StrongBot. Um, we will have redundancy on a satellite level. So as we were explaining before, we have redundancy from a StrongBot point of view. We have um, the boxes on, on different satellites. But we will have this thing again with secure storage itself. So we will have also this component on uh, multiple satellites. Um, it's implementation agnostic, what we're saying. So from the outside, um, let's say flex forms. Flex forms interact with secure storage and we don't care if it's the card was stored in SDS or or strong. That, that's 
that's the scope of secure storage sort of. But from an outside point of view, we're not ho hooking directly to SDS or hooking directly to Strongbot. How that's configured, that's up to secure storage. And it's easily extendable. So um, the point of this is that to move from SDS to Strongbot, it's a painful process. And moving forward, let's say we don't want to stay with Strongbot or we want multiple systems. This will allow us to easily do that. Um, Sorry? No, it's an entirely new component. And it's an secure storage, it's in-house. Strongbot is not in-house. So, uh, as I was explaining, to simply uh, know what um, system under the hood you're using, it's a simple database configuration. So, even on production right now, we have both SDS and Strongbot enabled. They're both being used right now. But if, for example, something is wrong, is going wrong with Strongbot, and we want to go back to SDS, we can easily do that with a simple database update. And uh, at that point in time, um, all the cards that we have, they can still work, because they're in both SDS and Strongbot. And the new cards, we will store them in SDS. And that way, we will have no downtime. So, so that's the benefit of this. You have um, easy, easy control over which systems you're using. So currently, both systems are up, and there are cards in one and cards in the other. Uh, both no. Cards are involved. We'll be going over exactly how they're stored later. So, but for now, it's, it's enough that we know this. And again, we just, from secure storage, we have records that they, database records where we map the card to the stored system. So we can know if a card is stored in SDS, we can know if a card is stored in both, or if we can know if a card is stored in Strongbot only, for example. So moving on. So now we'll be going over um, for the timeline um, of how we put the system in production. So the first thing is that um, we put secure storage with just SDS enabled and the default system. So we wanted to we wanted secure storage to just replace SDS, but everything, the, how the traffic flows and how the data is stored, it's exactly the same. So what this means is that previously requests would come and hit SDS only, and we wanted to reroute that to hit secure storage only. So we place secure storage in production just in Phoenix, um, it just had a TCP endpoint, and the configuration was that we we only use SDS. So that way, we're doing exactly everything the same, but with secure storage as a, a as an extra step, sort of. So to start introducing it slowly, and the change is a simple uh, LTM switch, basically. So um, after that, we introduce Strongbot into the system. So this red box, that's the only change that uh, happened. So you offer the same API, basically? Yes. Yes, as I said before, um, secure storage is backwards compatible with SDS. And we offered exactly, through, through, a, through a TCP endpoint, exactly what was offered through SDS. It's important to maintain sort of what was working before. and. Even new cards, they will still work exactly the same. So this was a simple database configuration. What this means is that new cards will now be stored in both SDS and Strongbot. That's all it means. The cards that we had before, they're still in SDS. And if we try and fetch them, they still work. So secure storage has logic in it, in it that um, it searches in, if a card is in SDS, it fetches it from SDS. If a card is in both, it attempts to fetch it from Strongbot, and if it fails, it gets it from SDS. There's this type of logic. And the card, <coughs> you refer to the card by the ID, I guess, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, in fact, what we did, um, so from a secure storage point of view, there are two IDs. There's the external ID and the card ID. The external ID, it's, uh, it's what we communicate with the outside world with. And the card ID is the actual um, ID used by the underlying. So they have, might have the same, you might, different cards with the same ID. Exactly. 
Um, sorry, I don't know. The internal ID. Mm-hmm. The one that says yes or strong or no. Yes. Yeah. Different cards stored in different databases might have the same internal ID. Yes. So, for example, let's say we have a card which is both SD in SDS and Strongbot. So, the external ID of Secure Storage, it will be exactly the same as SDS, because we want to maintain the course compatibility. Ah, uh, right. That's how it works. And the card ID, that will be the Strongbot token. So, it will be a different ID, what Strongbot gives us. And this way, we have a link both with SDS and Strongbot. So... And then we did the migration. So this was actually done uh, from the US side. Um, so they created a separate component. Um, basically what it does is it takes a dump from the SDS database. Um, and for each record, we get the card number, we add it in Strongwood, and the record in secure storage so that we'll, we'll have the link, basically. Um, this was done in incremental batches as well. Um, migration is finished, so as we stand right now on production, all the cards are in both SDS and Strongbot. How much data is Um, I'm sure we had yeah, so some 60 million records. That's why it was important to do it in better sort of, so not to affect the system as, because you have traffic incoming all the time. And in the meantime, we're doing migration as well. So that might impact. Um, um, no. Card numbers. They're unique. What can be changed with the expiry data? Um, so it can be updated. No, we don't store it to be adapted by the end. Um, so what happens if the expiry changes while the migration? We are, so some of us are not encrypting the expiry date. We're encrypting just the uh, card numbers. So you check it basically after you copy it, you check it again. No, because the migration just takes into account the credit card number. So you look at the credit card number and you encrypt it back into strong one. And you don't say the expired date. The expired date, that, that layer was moved into secure yes. storage. As I was explaining, the expiry ID is just a simple computation. So there's no funky logic that encrypted it. It's moved up. Exactly. We basically copied exactly how they do it uh, from SDS and took that logic and placed it in secure storage. So when we add a new card, now it's passing to both systems? Yes. The default system is stronger, but secure storage, again, keeps backwards compatibility in mind, and it says, look, I know the default system is stronger, but I'm going to put it in SDS as a backup. You mentioned before if there's a downtime in one of the systems, you use the remaining. When you bring them both back up, you have to sync. Um, so, um, okay. No, right now, because there are multiple phases. Um, the initial phase is, for example, the default system was SDS, yes, and you say, and then we had the migration. At that point, we started saving them. Actually, we had a phase where new cards were strong and instead of yes. The important thing is that strong secure storage always has a, has a knowledge of where it is. So at one point, strong was the main system, and as a failover, it would check in, in SDS. So for this system, you would try to get it from SDS. The phase, the phase, but like it was a fault there. Um, you can say there must be a case where uh, this is the loop go apart, yes, and that, but that would happen only in case of an outage of one of the systems. We didn't have such an outage until now, but the plan is that if you do have, we would rerun the migration again for the for the one time. So you can actually use this as a reconciliation tool where you run it again. The migration part. Uh, let, let's go uh, quickly through the database. Maybe it helps. So this is how I mean that secure storage knows which system is uh, enabled or not enabled. So right now, this is how it is on production. Uh, Strongot is the default system. So we store in Strongot, but we keep in mind to store in SDS as a backup, and both systems are enabled. 
if something happens with stronger then we want to migrate back to SDS as a temporary fix, we can do that simply by turning off Stronghold and putting SDS as the default. That way we keep all compatibility and new cards will be handled as well. If we see an example of cards, so, so this is a, an example of a card in SDS, the 447. The external ID and the actual uh, internal system ID, they're the same because it's SDS. We're saying that the system is two, because uh, two is SDS. And the one under it is an example of a card which is in both SDS and Stronghold. So this uh, 100, that's the Stronghold token. And the system ID is linking it to three. If we were to uh, revert back to SDS only, this would work. Why? Because we would have backwards compatibility through this ID. So that's how it all works, basically. Okay, hopefully this is, it. this is better. So, let's hunt. So that's the migration, basically. And the next step was um, integration with the build base. So most of this work was done from the Serbia side, and it involved introducing a REST endpoint. So one that we move, try and move forward, uh, we, we move away from using the pair scripts, and we just uh, simply use REST. Um, but obviously we still want to maintain compatibility with the old systems, so that's why we started with TCP endpoint. But this uh, this one introduced uh, the REST endpoint, which we were, we're using from Sysable Pay. So same functionality, but through a different endpoint. Uh, and the next uh, step is actually going multi-satellite. So this is what we're, uh, right now we're testing on dev at the moment, um, and that's scheduled for next June. So we will add redundancy and failover. Um, how the, will this work is that we will introduce a new component, the secure storage gateway. Um, this will act as a rerouting mechanism. So whenever requests are made, either TCP or REST, um, they hit the secure storage gateway. And it does a REST call to the secure storage service, which now which will handle the core logic. As you can see, it will this all of this will be on Phoenix Ash and an LD. Um, and we will all we will see later on how the the gateway will handle, for example, in the case of a, a problem with Phoenix, how it will handle uh, redirection. So. <laughs> so, as we w that's a future release. So, a future release, we will completely remove SDS. So, but you're moving to satellites before you're moving to SDS, right? Yes. Now, SDS is only in Phoenix. Yes. So, until you could go to a secure storage in Netherlands, which will then route to SDS in Phoenix? No, it will route to secure storage in Phoenix. So the secure storage gateway, mm -hmm. so beforehand, whether something is in SDS or Stronghold, you think we'll be going through the routing? Let's go through the routing later, and maybe it will be clearer. So, in fact, um, we'll go, be going over the redundancy thing. So, as I explained, we have redundancy by replication on a satellite level. So we have the data that's replicated on Phoenix Ash and NLD. And um, what will this will achieve is Request will be still handled even if one of those nodes is down. Um, the failover mechanism, uh, we're using HA proxy. So this was uh, implemented um, through collaboration with uh, application services and architecture. Um, HA proxy is basically it's similar to uh, F5. So it's a TCP HTTP load balancer, but it handles as well the direction on a satellite level. Um, so the challenges are that what happens if we might have duplicate cards before replication finishes. So let's say we have a store card on Phoenix, the same store card on Ash, and they happened at the same time. If replication did not happen in time, what we will end up with in our databases is different records that map to the same card. And the implications of this is that, for example, if we try from the support page and we load subscriptions related to a card, we might not get all of the subscriptions because they're getting from a particular ID, which uh, 
there were transactions that were passed with that ID, and we won't get the other because they were passed with a different ID. This Sorry? This problem has happened. It has been I think that was to give we were actually when we were having actually went to setting board data. And there were two problems. Originally, that was just SDS on the bus way back initially. And then we had this issue with um, Saka, where we're talking with them, where basically we had mm -hmm. two IDs, uh -huh. right? And uh, which were basically referring to the same, to the same car. Yeah, um, as so, since we have redundancy, both uh, replication, both from a stronger point of view and from secure storage point of view, that in itself, uh, not it's not a problem, but the problem can, uh, can originate from from two from two sources. And in fact, um, uh, what's interesting is that how the data is manifested in the database, it will be different depending if the, the application happened from Strongot um, or if it originated from secure storage. And how we will tackle this is that we will have a monitoring mechanism which will check uh, for consistency in our database records. And if there is a problem, uh, we're, al we're al alerted basically. Um, we're using uh, Senso for this. So how it works is that this uh, component, it will log, put a warn log, Senso will identify that warn log and it will send an email um, to, to the mailing list that people are in. Um, so if there is a problem, how will we tackle this? Um, it's the, the solution is to fix the database record. So um, you pick uh, a primary uh, ID. So and we we update all the other records um, to be that uh, ID basically. Thanks. Questions on this? So moving on. So. Now I will show how redundancy will work, both when it, everything is fine and when uh, a node is down. So in this case, let's say that I use there in Malta, um, it tries to access flex forms. The GTM, it will redirect him to the flex forms on an, on an LD, since the Netherlands is the nearest one. Um, so flex forms, it's on, on the TC Fabrics machines. So they are a cluster of machines. Um, from flex forms on the Netherlands, we will send a request, uh, a TCP or a request or a REST, we don't care. And it will be picked up by the gateway on the Netherlands, because as I said, we have this this, struct, this system on Phoenix Ash and NLD. Um, the secure storage gateway will go to the HA proxy, and the HA proxy will say, look, um, is secure storage service the nearest one up? The nearest one is NLD it, it, it itself. So it will redirect to secure storage service. It will check the health check, and if it's up, it will send it to secure storage service on NLD. So that's basically when we have a working node. In the case of a failing node, we will go exactly through the same process. But when the gateway on NLD hits AJ proxy, AJ proxy will say, look, I tried to go to secure storage service on NLD, and it's not working. So it will then fail over to the nearest Secure storage service, which is up. Um, in this case, it's Phoenix, for example, and the call will still be serviced. So that's basically how it will work. And if, let's say, Phoenix is down, it will redirect again to Ashburn. So you have um, the, the the redundancy. It's up to it's prepared basically. Um, the gateway as well, it has a retry mechanism. So if, for example, it, it fails on an LD for the first time, it, it tries again. But if it doesn't, then it redirects. Which, that's why we sort of, we're not going directly to the HA proxy immediately. So we can have custom logic over here um, on the redirection. Uh, yeah, but what if secure storage then tries to um, read from SDS uh, or Strongbot and it fails? What happens then? So, uh, if there's a problem with SDS, um, we we use only Strongbot. 
So that's uh, at the moment if strong got fails, we fail over on a satellite level. So right now on production, we we're only in Phoenix right now. So if strong got is down, then our failover mechanism is SDS. So if a request comes in and we attempt to store first in strong God, but we failed, we'll say there's nothing to do. Let's do the best thing and store in SDS only. Uh, moving forward with uh, satellites, uh, the, the redundancy shift will, there will be a shift in the train of thought, sort of. Um, we will not use SDS, our failover mechanism. We will use the satellite as our failover mechanism. But the thing is, but the strongest down, that the secure storage service is down. Yes. Yeah, I'm assuming there is a hand check in the secure storage. Exactly. Once you actually write, then all of them happen. So in that case, secure storage service will say, I failed, go back to the gateway, and the gateway will say, okay, let me try your nearest. Yes. Something like that. Yes. Actually, they can't process that logic. The gateway, what it does is that it, it knows the whole fake thing and it just does the same code. With well, HA proxy does it. Then HA the proxy decides All right. where to redirect the well. At no point do we try on SDS then? No. The failover mechanism is on a satellite level. So unless the secure storage service finds out that only the card is only an SDS. Satellite. Right? Satellite. Um, yes. Yeah. But the thing is this, uh, so, let's keep on saying, if right now, with the migration, so any card which is in uh, SDS should be in strong mode. If, um, and right now we have a fallback mechanism to SDS, so strong mode fails to fall back to SDS. If that is the case, we have a monitoring that will tell us uh, the cards are in SDS only, so make sure to migrate them back to stronger than it is. Now the minute we go into the, so the assumption is that all the cards that are in SDS will be in town. Now the minute we go to the satellite, um, the failover won't be to SDS. So we'll still write to SDS as a, as a backup, but the fallback will be across the satellite. So if one node goes down, you will fail over to the other. But if you're in the Netherlands and you want to write a SDS as a backup, you will go you will write it. You will uh, you will go to C, but not through the uh, redirection. Basically, in the configuration file, you go to Phoenix, you right. check, and you write there. Because obviously, a SDS is only there. Um, but they don't have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Obviously, yeah. the complexity of the system is because we wanted to keep. So, a requirement was that uh, if Phoenix is down, we can't reach Phoenix, let's say the natural partition, we don't use code. So, um, we, we cannot rely on SDS being reachable because if the link is down, we can't reach Phoenix, so we can't lose the code. Uh, at the same time, um, we want to keep SDS for a while just so that we get more confidence with Stronger. That's obviously the, the core of the business. So if, if that, that engine goes out, basically the business is you know. um, That's why then you're keeping at the end why moving to satellite and web. Yeah, yes, yes. Again, it was a requirement from business so for their peace of mind. So it's complicated matters for you know, yes. keeping at the end why moving to satellite. Um, I don't have an idea, Andy, regarding the requirement. No, no, it's eventual consistency. Again, because the requirement is that if Phoenix we can't reach it, then we cannot lose the code. So yeah, I was wondering if there was a forum coming to the No, so. So what it says doesn't give you that score. Um, when we were discussing the, the reputation mechanism for our own database, um, we went for native replication, which is uh, completely asynchronous. 
Um, but then what we do is we have a, a reconciliation uh, process that will detect if, uh, if a record is not is not matching, basically. And so the idea was that when the reconciliation detects inconsistencies, it will fix automatically the data uh, in our system. But the problem is that legacy stuff basically we have those IDs scattered all over the place. And so uh, for now, we're not doing it automatically. Um, eventually, we, will, we can do that as well. And another point on this. Um, so as I was explaining, th um, this we will have problems when we have uh, store cards happening on different satellites um, ver as, as small time frames, sort of. And the probability of that happening is extremely low. So that, that's why we sort of went for a monitoring mechanism, because we're not expecting, actually, it to, to be a lot. Basically, it would be somewhat the same card where you're sitting, sitting NLD, say, and the Phoenix right at the same time. <laughs> With the same card. Well, it doesn't offer something, it does for mm, Well, it offers, I mean, it does offer replication, but. Replication over what? It's able to. That's what we're using. And after, it's switched off for us. And no, the replication is working. But it doesn't give you anything. And basically, it's a venture consistent, so um, you're right, if one knows, if it comes to each other knows now, then eventually, when. And replication, it's fast, so we're not saying it's extremely slow, as in... Yeah, I guess the, 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 nature, the thing is that the nature of our, of our business is that people will go on a, on a form and they will uh, make, a, make, a make, a, make a payment. As we're saying, you are rooted there to the GDM and you have also... <coughs> Uh, session ticket, so it's not like you're going to be directed um, all over the place. <coughs> 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 something that we build or something that Yes, uh, an in-house um, component as well. So the problem is just working on the uh, data state up to the yes. It will run once a day, and it will check those cards which have been added that day. Uh, yes. No. Well, again, the retrieval of those cards, uh, and it happens on rebuilds. Uh, uh, otherwise, it will be the same user logging in ready to pay. And Okay, let's move. So, um, last topic um, that we'll cover. So, um, for this uh, project, we ran performance tests. Um, so, basically, we were using JMeter. Um, the, the performance setup is only on QA. Um, so, we have four QA machines um, that we're using, uh, that we use JMeter to, to hit them. Um, we have the simple pair script that connects to secure storage, and we use JMeter to execute those pair scripts um, all the time. So what does JMeter uh, provide you with? Um, we can set up test cases, so as I explained, uh, we can run scripts to either to store a card and get its information. We can set up conditional actions. So um, one of the use cases that we had in this is that, so, so the test case, how it's done is, uh, if you can see the diagram, get credit card info, this generates a random, a, a random card. Insert SDS will insert the card into secure storage. Um, then we will do get on that um, on, on the inserted card to, to assert that we have the correct response, basically, the correct ID. Um, so what we do is when we do an insert, we, we give the card the card and we get back an ID. We, we keep that ID in a variable, and then we run get to ensure that we get back the, that same variable. And the conditional actions were useful 
that we don't do get if we have uh, failed inserts, because obviously they will fail. Um, we, you can't uh, run get if the variable containing the ID from this store was not populated. So you will have uh, lots of false positives in that case. You can also configure the number of samples uh, or threads, so uh, you can affect the throughput as well. Um, we can run assertions and we have useful statistics. So here we can see a sample run. We know the, num the total number of samples that were run. Uh, we have the error rate. Um, this is the throughput, uh, um, how many hits we're having per second. Um, that's basically it. Yes. But yeah. So um, basically, this one is 25% because what we were doing is we were from so the the JMeter mach machines they're only in Phoenix, but we were running performance tests for NLD. So what we were doing, we were running it the from NLD. And every time it was going to Phoenix and sending it back. And obviously, a lot of tests were failing due to timeouts. So we have a timeout of five seconds on the on the client side. So that's why there was the the error rate. So to make sense, we, you would need to test from an LD to an LD machine for it to make sense. Otherwise, the performance test will not mean anything because it's not normal condition sort of. So, this is, yes, in fact, we did run, run, run them for routing as well. We'll mention it later, in fact. So, this is a sample run. So, these are all positive uh, test cases, and there's one of them which fails. And um, then we can get the time that it was run. This is useful so that we can go to the secretary service logs and correlate exactly what happened. We can know that. From this time, we can search during the time period for the error. Um, we have the actual request. So this is a test get card number. And this is the ID that was provided. Uh, and, and again, we can search through the logs for this ID. So we bring down sort of the, the number of logs that we need to look at. And this is the error response. Um, these numbers, they are the the line number of the, the pair script that it was executed from. So we can know to debug, we can go there and see um, what was failing. So um, why bother the performance testings, testing? Um, so first thing is to ensure thread safety, that uh, threads don't affect each other, basically. Um, to, we do that as well to verify that requests are handled well under load. And also to keep a baseline that we know sort of um, for the, 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 these amounts of hits per second, we're fine. Um, in fact, the production baseline is around three hits per second, but when we actually do performance testing, we do more. And how we can actually stress test it more, sort of, we can do that by configuring either the number of samples or the number of threads. So we increase the throughput that way. Um, actual examples where performance, performance testing proved useful were, so in the beginning, um, we were noticing that calls were failing for some reason, and we had no idea why. So this is back from the initial release. And from initial investigation and performance testing, we nailed it down to the underlying pair scripts that were used to connect to, that actually send the TCP request. And, uh, get back the TCP response, they were actually not that safe. So again, this is legacy code that we're dealing with. But performance testing helped us to identify the problem. Another problem was on our end. So we were using a Java repair, which connects to SDS. And previously, it did not have uh, handling of timeouts. But when we introduced it, um, Everything was looked at to appear to be working well, but under heavy load, we were noticing that in some cases, the ID was not missing the card. What was happening was um, when the first store card was failing due to timeout, the connection was being kept open and it was leaking into the next one. So 
So it was passing that ID to the next card. Obviously that's very bad because you you don't have the same ID linking to the same card, basically. Um, but again, the, this kind of stuff, conventional debugging is won't sort of you won't figure things out with it. So this was important to have performance testing. And the next the next thing as Clayton was mentioning was to test the HA proxy failover. So um we were communicating with Edward because it was behind most of the HA proxy thing. Um he was changing the configuration stuff from the HA proxy and we were hitting it to see uh, that it was behaving um correctly. We keep a baseline, so we know sort of that um, under with this amount of throughput, we sort of know that the error rate is low. There are th there will be some errors due to time loss, but I mean, if over the course of you get a 0 0.02 percent, and they're due to time out, we can sort of still be um, confident about it. And, and as I said, we're hitting it more than production. Really with the state of something like Grafana to see how mm. the performance. I mean, especially if there's a release, mm. you can see if you need mm. the release of the error rate myself. Yes. So, that's, that's a good point. Um, so, that's it. Let's conclude the presentation. So, if you have any questions, ask. Feel free to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were questions asked. So. Maybe from Serbia, any questions? I have a question. Um, let's go over to Serbia. Yes? Uh, what will be... What we... <laughs> I'll keep in mind. Uh, yes? Uh, what will be handling this replication? Is it some built-in functionality of strong auth or some database built-in functionality for replication? What, what What's the idea? Uh, so, I mean, replication, from a good point of view, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know how they do it. I don't know if it's simple MySQL native replication. They, they, they implement their custom. Yeah, they have a custom implementation. But from a secure storage point of view, uh, which is ours, um, I think we're using my, MySQL native replication, right? So that's how we're replicating the data. Does that answer the question? Yeah, OK, thank you. Cool. So, um, uh, <laughs> can you performance of StrongWord and secure storage? Sorry, SDS. SDS. Um, Insert and retrieval. Well, I think I, because what you're saying is that uh, we have additional latency, sort of. Do you, we have additional logic? Yeah, so uh, whether uh, what we wrote is better or uh, uh, Ah, okay. Well, technically, with secure storage, it should take longer, because um, one, we're hitting two So, So when the client sent a request previously to SDS, it just was handling it and it was sending us. Oh, oh that's grand. No, progress technology. No, I think between SDS, so I'm not sure if there were any metrics on SDS. What we made sure on Stronghold was basically that, like it was saying, that if this was getting X amount on production, we can manage more. Performance for SDS, right. how much it can <coughs> handle or whatever, I'm not sure if there was no. ever some. Okay, so how did you come to choose from what that, 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 that was an exercise that was done way, way back. Um, but yes, metrics were collected and eventually the choice. Uh, uh, was one to, no, is that it's a long production team. The same one is we can actually have room to improve. Yeah. But just to give you an idea, like, uh, that, was, that, that exercise was from the time when uh, people like Joe Cordino were around. So, Ultimately, we had already, when this project started, eventually, we already had the appliances, and uh, so it wasn't, it was done with a previous version. So, so the, uh, 
Clayton mentioned also, I mean, for sure there are scenarios where parallelization of the court could improve performance. So that's enough. But there are some scenarios where it has to be sequential by, by the nature of the court. So. Another interesting point that so, sort of recently came out is you want to go in? <laughs> no, but um, so apart from the performance benefits redundancy, I mean, with strong as it is, yes, it's very difficult as well to understand exactly how, it, as I said, it's like the code. Um, an interesting point that came up um, so if you try and insert a 19 digit credit card right now, it as yet does not ref refuse it. So it fails. So that could be helpful for us to deprecate SDS, for example. We can add support for that, because Strongot does allow it. Uh, Strongot, it, it simply accepts a string. Theoretically, you can store any sensitive information you want as a string. So, it, and for example, if you have complex data, you can model it as JSON if you want. And you can pass it on to Strongot as a string. You can fetch it back uh, as a string as well. The string will be the ID. But yes, it's it's much more flexible, and as I said, we have support as well in case something goes wrong. So we definitely need to go that route. Underlying storage of from what is it MySQL or is it something? Um, I think it's Postgres. I'm not sure. But basically, what they give you is a server. Uh, so you're just like calling it, but uh, yeah, I think they. You know how they tell as and part of the beginning. We, you know, we, we ran into some issues because of the sheer amount of data mm -hmm. and even the thinking between mm -hmm. the boxes. Like I think the last I heard to sync between Ashburn and then and the and Phoenix that is to sync the data, it takes roughly twenty days from scratch. So, so the thing is the 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 shopping of sixty minutes. 60 million encryption, the whole transfer of the data, the whole shit. But also, you know, take into consideration that when you ship such uh, devices um, with the legislation of UHS around the US, there is a regulatory process. So they have to seal it and stuff like that. So the actual, migrate, the actual shipping takes long because of this process. So then the delta from when we started to when it actually was wrecked and so from the left to the physical yes, 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 yes. it's placed the uh, yeah, 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 we, we had it wrecked in uh, the Phoenix set. When it came to sending it over to Ash and then D with this procedure, obviously for Ash it's much more easy. But for N L D you have to go to this process. And so, yeah, and then more tempering stuff coming in. Uh, and that's, and that's one, of the, and one of the things that's holding us back from expanding to other nodes as well, the legislation. So it's not as simple to just say, hey, let's have a particular node in Singapore, in Serbia. It's, when it's outside of the EU, it's even more complex. When it's between US and the EU, it's a bit easier. When it's moving to what the what not all like their countries, especially from an EU and US legislation point of view. So it's mostly it's not actually from God. Uh, no, no, it's like it's like it's laws of the country, mainly the US. It's like when the whole you have the whole encryption thing with Java and they export it and the sort of thing. It's even more complex for this because in theory even more secure, yeah. There are no prices on the website. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they something. It's not as funny as the human body version. They charge a friend of mine. And they have a support package. Okay, right, 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 I think it's clapping time for them. So I'm gonna stop.
presenting and stop the recording as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, kids. So, I just start performance testing to Java. Stop performing. Stop recording. <laughs>